you remember what we're doing. We're looking, we're doing overviews of each book of the Bible on Sunday evenings. We're plowing through 1 Corinthians on Sunday mornings. But we're doing this so that we can see how in each book of the Bible, Jesus Christ is, is represented. Seeing Jesus in all of Scripture is our, is our agenda. And we're in the Psalms. And the Psalms is a pretty massive task. I've, I've looked at it every way that I could this week and couldn't figure out a way. So I was, I was left with two choices. One was to do an inadequate job of covering the entire 150 psalms in one evening. The other was to break up the psalms into the five books that are actually, that, that compile or comprise the psalms. That would take us five weeks. So what I determined to do was to try to move through in a couple of Sunday evenings, get us through the psalms, all right? So we want to pray tonight before we get going. Uh, one of the, We mentioned some things to pray about this morning. Faye Ritter, uh, scheduled to have knee surgery the 4th. I think you told me this morning, Faye, you're going to have a, be a, have a, a scope uh, this week, uh, upper GI type of a scope. We want to pray about that. That's, that's midweek. For Bill Gordon, as he... My mic's on, okay. And then, uh, and then Judy Olds, who's uh, kidney numbers, that which measure the effectiveness and the health of your kidneys, have dropped drastically to the uh, to the level where she's borderline needing to begin dialysis. We want to pray that God will touch her and bring those back up. Matt has a uh, has a interview tomorrow. We told the folks in prayer meeting this past Wednesday that, that Matt and Ashley got back from their trip to see her, her uh, grandfather, who's critically ill out in California, came back and received notice that their income uh, has been effectively cut in half. And so they're dealing with uh, just trying to get on top of, of bills that are coming up and to try to be good stewards. So pray for his interview at 315 tomorrow. All right. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, you're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we come to you tonight in Jesus' name. We're grateful for your word. Uh, the psalmist said it, and we embrace it. Your word is a, uh, is a lamp unto our feet. It's a light unto our path, and we know the value of hiding your word in our heart, which checks within us a remaining sin Help us tonight as we look at, begin looking at the book of Psalms. Uh, it, is, it is majestic uh, in, its, in its scope. It tells us so many things about who you are. Uh, it tells us honestly things about who we are. And it gives us hope. Many times in the midst of lamentation, it gives us hope because of your Redeemer, our Savior, the Messiah, Jesus Christ. So help us to tune tonight to see what we need to see, to learn, uh, begin to wrap our arms around uh, this, this collection of, of prayers and praise. And be edified and strengthened in it, and renewed and more focused to declare Jesus Christ in all of his glory to a world that is desperately in need of hope. We pray tonight for Matt and this, uh, this appointment coming up tomorrow, this interview. Lord, I pray that you would give him favor, that open opportunities and plant him and establish him in a livelihood that will uh, uh, help offset this, uh, this loss of income that has uh, surprisingly come to them, this challenging providence that they face. We pray for Faye, that you will strengthen her in the test this week and prepare her for the surgery approaching in August, early August, that you'll be all she needs you to be. Bring her through it without complications, we pray, and in promoting healing in her life. We pray for Bill Gordon, that you will help him to move forward as he can come closer and closer to the prosthetic device being fitted for him so that he might be up and back about the things you've called him to do. and Be back among us. We know how he wants to be here with your people. We pray for Judy. Lord, just strengthen her. We're all surprised. She was shocked to hear 
how the numbers measuring the well-being of her kidney have dropped so drastically. And we look to you as Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, and ask you to touch her, strengthen her, turn, turn that matter around for your glory and for her good. And so now we offer ourselves to you. We want your Holy Spirit to be our teacher. Help us to see Jesus in this passage of Scripture, in this book of the Bible. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to uh, Psalm 1914 and Psalm 145, 21. Find those two places, mark them, and then stand with me if you would and follow along as I read from these passages, which sort of give us, they're just, they're just a taste of, uh, of the Word of God, of this book of the Bible. Psalm 1914, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. This, was the, this psalm was on, on display and focus of the youth camp that our young people went to last month, Psalm 19, and it closes with this, this, this desire uh, that our, our speech, our heart meditations, be pleasing to God. Psalm 145, 21, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. What have we just read together? We just read the inerrant, infallible, all sufficient word of God. And we ask the Lord tonight to take his word, make it effectual in our minds and our hearts so that what the psalmist says, that our speech our contemplations would please him and that our mouths would be filled with praise to God with the, with the result that those who hear our praise to God would join in and bless his holy name forever and ever. Thank you. Please be seated. This book of Psalms, 150 of them, and the words, we get psalms from the Greek word, psalmoi, which means, which means a song sung to the accompaniment of an instrument that you would pluck, a stringed instrument of some sort. This was written and compiled, what we call the book of Psalms, was written and compiled over a period of about a thousand years. Uh, psalm 90 is a psalm of Moses, so from the time of Moses to the time of return from the exile that we've talked about in the historical books. Psalm 126 reflects that. It was used uh, during, the, during the kingdom period as a temple hymn book. And it stands as the longest, most often quoted, most diverse book of the Old Testament. And we'll kind of see why that is. I want us now to watch this, uh, this video from our friends uh, at the Bible Project on uh, the summary of the book of Psalms. The book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 ancient Hebrew poems, songs, and prayers that come from all different periods in Israel's history. Many of these poems are connected with King David, 73 actually, and he was known as a poet and a harp player. But there are many different authors behind these poems. There's the poems of Asaph, or from the sons of Korah, and some are from other worship leaders in the temple. Even Solomon and Moses have their own poems, and nearly one-third of these are anonymous. Now, many of these poems came to be used by the choirs that sang in Israel's temple, but the Book of Psalms is actually not a hymn book. At some point in the period after Israel's exile to Babylon, these ancient poems were gathered together and intentionally arranged into the book of Psalms before us. And it has a very unique design and message that you're not going to notice unless you read it from beginning to end. Now to see how the book of Psalms is designed, it's actually most helpful to start at the end. The book concludes with five poems of praise to the God of Israel, and each one begins and ends with the word hallelujah, which is Hebrew for a command to tell a group of people to praise 
Yah, which is short for the divine name Yahweh. Now, that's a really nice five-part arrangement, and it looks like someone's giving us a conclusion here to the book. So it invites the question, does the book have any other signs of intentional design? If you pay attention to the headings of the poems, you'll notice that at five places, your Bible translators have the heading book one, book two, book three, four, and five at various points, and that these divide the book into five large sections. Now, the reason for this is is that the final poem in each of those sections have a very similar ending that looks like an editorial edition. It reads something like, May the Lord, the God of Israel, be blessed forever and ever. Amen and amen. So the book has a conclusion. It has an internal organization into five main parts. And so the natural place to go from here is now the beginning to look for an introduction. And what do we find? Psalms 1 and 2. Two, which stand outside of book one because most of the poems in book one are linked to David except Psalms one and two, which are anonymous. Psalm one celebrates how blessed the person is who meditates on the Torah, prayerfully reading it day and night and then obeying it. Now the word Torah simply means teaching and more specifically it came to refer to the five books of Moses that begin the Old Testament. And here actually the word seems to be used with both meanings in mind which explains why it has five main parts. The book of Psalms is being offered as a new Torah that will teach God's people the lifelong practice of prayer as they strive to obey God's commands given in the first Torah. Psalm 2 is a poetic reflection on God's promise to King David from 2 Samuel chapter 7, that one day a messianic king would come and establish God's kingdom over the world, defeat evil and rebellion among the nations. Now Psalm 2 concludes by saying that all those who take refuge in in the Messianic King will be blessed, precisely the word used to open Psalm 1. And so together, these two poems tell us that the book of Psalms is designed to be the prayer book of God's people as they strive to be faithful to the commands of the Torah as they hope and wait for the future Messianic Kingdom. Now with these two themes introduced, we can start to see how the smaller books have been designed as well around these two ideas. So for example, book one has right at the center a collection of poems, Psalms 15 through 24, that opens and closes with a call to covenant faithfulness. And then, Psalm 16 to 18, we find a depiction of David as a model of this kind of faithfulness. So he calls out to God to deliver him, and God elevates him as king. Now, in the corresponding set of poems, Psalms 20 to 23, the David of the past has become an image of the messianic king of the future, who will also call out to God, he will be delivered, and then given a kingdom over the nations. And then right at the center of this collection is a poem, Psalm 19, dedicated to praising God for the Torah. So here we go. The two themes from Psalms 1 and 2 are bound together tightly here. Book 2 opens with two poems that are united in their hope for a future return to the temple in Zion. And this is an image closely associated with the hope of the Messianic Kingdom. Then Book 2 closes with a poem that depicts the future reign of the Messianic King over all of the nations. This poem's really amazing because it echoes all these other passages from the prophets about the messianic kingdom. And it concludes by saying that this king's reign will bring about the fulfillment of God's ancient promise to Abraham to bring God's blessing to all of the nations. Book three also concludes with a poem reflecting on God's promise to David, but this time in light of Israel's exile. So the poet remembers how God said he would never abandon the line of David, but now he's looking at Israel's rebellion and its result in destruction and exile and the downfall of the line of David. And so the poet ends by asking God to never forget his promise to David. Book four is designed to respond to this crisis of exile. So the opening poem returns us back to Israel's with a prayer of Moses. And he does what he did on Mount Sinai after the golden calf incident, which is to call upon God to show mercy. The center of book four is dominated by a group of poems that announce that the Lord, the God of Israel, reigns as the true king of the world, and that all creation, trees, mountains, rivers, are all summoned to celebrate that future day when God will bring his justice and kingdom over all the world. Book five opens with a series of poems that affirm that God hears the cries of his people and will one day send the future king to defeat evil and bring God's kingdom. This book also contains two larger collections, one called the Hollow and the other called the Songs of Ascents. Each one of these collections concludes with a poem about the future messianic 
kingdom. And these two collections together, they sustain the hope for a future Exodus-like act of God to redeem his people. And then, right between them is Psalm 119. It's the longest poem in the book. It's an alphabet poem. Each line begins with a new letter of the Hebrew alphabet, and it explores the wonder and the gift of the Torah as God's word to his people. So here we go. The themes from Psalm 1 and 2, Torah and Messiah, combined all together here in Book 5, which brings us all the way back to that five-poem conclusion. In the center poem, Psalm 148, all creation is summoned to praise the God of Israel because he has, quote, raised up a horn for his people. Now the horn here, it's a metaphor of a bull's horn raised in victory. And this image echoes back to the same image used in Hannah's song for Samuel chapter 2, but also to the earlier Psalm 132. The horn is a symbol for the future messianic king and his victory over evil. It's a fitting conclusion to this amazing book. Now, here's one more thing that you are likely going to miss if you don't read this book in order. There's lots of different kinds of poems in the book of Psalms, but they all basically fall into two big categories, either poems of lament or poems of praise. Poems of lament express pain, confusion, and anger about how horrible the world is and how horrible the things are happening to the poet. And so these poems draw attention to what's wrong in the world, and they ask God to do something about it. There's a lot of these in the book, which tells us something important, that lament is an appropriate response to the evil that we see in our world. But what you'll notice is that lament poems predominate earlier in the book, in books one through three. But pay attention, because you'll see praise poems occasionally too. Praise poems are poems of joy and celebration, and they draw attention to what's good in the world, and they retell stories of what God has done in our lives and thank God for it. In books four and five, you'll notice that praise poems come to outnumber lament poems, and it all culminates in that five-part hallelujah conclusion. So this shift from lament to praise, this is profound, and it tells us something about the nature of prayer. As we hope for the messianic kingdom, as the book teaches us to do, this will create tension for us as we look out on the tragic state of our world and of our lives. And so the Psalms teach us not to ignore the pain of our lives, but at the same time, biblical faith is forward-looking, looking to the promise of God's future messianic kingdom. And so Torah and Messiah, lament and praise, faith and hope. That's what the book of Psalms is all about. Another uh, great visual summary of this, of this book. And I think you would see in your own uh, journey, you can just check this, that as you grow in the Lord, as you grow, draw nearer and nearer to crossing that river that has no bridge, that, that more and more in your life, praise takes shape. And so I thought it was it's a fascinating progression that you see in the book of Psalms. A lot of lament early on and the last two sections, the last two books of the Psalms, praise begins to predominate as, as we have clearer and clearer views of the Messiah. Well, this, uh, this Psalter uh, that we have, uh, these five books, uh, each one of them ends in, uh, each one of the sections, as he said, ends in doxology. And we read, uh, we read one of those earlier in Psalm 145. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever. This, this idea of praising God in all things. And then, it's very interesting, I'm going to go ahead and take you to the end of the Psalms. Look at Psalm 150. If you follow the understanding that each one of the five books, the last Psalm in each of those ends in praise, doxology, then you're going to notice that Psalm 150 is just an explosion of doxology. Let me read that to you. Praise the Lord. Remember now, that's, if we're reading this in Hebrew, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with, the, with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. 
Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. There's this, the, the Psalms end with this great crescendo expression of how this God who is true to his Torah, true to his covenant, who is sending his Messiah to be the king who will put all his enemies under his feet. He is worthy of praise. And so the, you're going to see in a little while that the theme, when you look for a theme in, in Psalm, you look for a theme about worship. We'll see that in a minute. Uh, 116 of these 150 Psalms have superscriptions in them. In other words, it's a it's a psalm to or a psalm about. or this, And it's interesting, uh, these editorial superscriptions uh, show themselves to be historically accurate. And so in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, these superscriptions are actually numbered among the verses of the psalms. They're treated uh, as, a, as part and parcel uh, of the psalms. When you, when you start breaking some of those things down, this is one of the things we're going to do tonight. We're just going to break down some categories of psalms. They designate 57 psalms as mizmor, uh, M-I-Z-M-O-R, spelled in English, uh, a psalm. It's a song accompanied by a stringed instrument. Another 29 of the psalms are called shir, S-H-I-R, uh, a song that is... Uh, 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 that just speaks of the matter of it being a song. Thirteen are called maskil, M-A-S-K-I-L, a contemplative poem. That's why we've entitled the study in the Psalms uh, of, of prayer and praise because there's, there's a mixture here. There's a lot of them that are prayers. There's a lot of them that were sung as a part of the, of the liturgical worship of the people of God. Six of these Psalms are called miktam, M-I-K-T-A-M, or miktam. Uh, perhaps it means an epigram or an inscription poem. Five of them are, are called tepila, uh, which is prayer. And then one of them, Psalm 145, which we read portion earlier, is a tehila, which is called praise. There are, uh, there are these classifications of the Psalms according to uh, themes. I think I have that. Uh, do you have that available, Michelle? Okay. And it is uh, the creation Psalms are some of those. And then the uh, Psalm 8 and 19 particularly. Uh, and I want to just look at this real quickly with you to get, give you a flavor. Why would they call this a creation? If you know Psalm 8, uh, you know immediately why it's in that category. Let me just read a portion of that. Psalm 8 it says to the choir master, there's one of your inscriptions, according to the, to the Gatith, a Psalm of David. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You set your glory about the So here these descriptions now about God as creator. Out of the mouths of babes and infants, you've established strength because of your foes. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you care for him? So it goes on. This is one of these, these strong psalms that takes in the creative activity and power of God. And then Psalm Psalm 19. Psalm 19 uh, to the choir master, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The sky above proclaims his handiwork. And so for these first, uh, first uh, six verses, there's these, this majestic language about the creative activity and the result of God's creative activity. And it's in the, in the light of God, the sovereign creator, that, that verses uh, six and following, uh, verse seven and following, the law of the Lord is perfect. It begins to describe the Torah and, and, and aspects of the Torah. So you have these, these creation Psalms in Psalm eight and 19. You have the, an, an Exodus Psalm in Psalm 78 about the, God taking his people out of captivity. Uh, a penitence Psalm, Psalm six. I want you to see that with me. Just getting a flavor of the different types. Again, an inscription on it to the choir master with stringed instruments according to the, to the Shemineth Psalm of David. O Lord, 
rebuke me not in your anger, nor discipline me in your wrath. Be gracious to me, O Lord, for I am languishing. Heal me, O Lord, for my bones are troubled. My soul also is greatly troubled. But you, O Lord, how long? Turn, O Lord, deliver my life. Save me for the sake of your steadfast love. For in death there is no remembrance of you. In Sheol, who will give you praise? I'm weary with my mourning. Every night I flood my bed with tears. You hear this? This, this is one of those laments. Here is uh, David, who is grievous, who is repentant. Depart from me, workers of, of evil. For the Lord has heard the sound of my weeping. Notice how the movements, we've talked about this before, how it moves from this great lament to this confidence that God has heard and is answering. So there's, a, there's one of the penitent psalms. Pilgrimage psalms, 120 to 134. These, this, this encompasses a part of that whole song, uh, the songs of ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T, all right? Where, where as they were on their way up to Jerusalem on pilgrimage, they would sing uh, these psalms in sequence. And then the Messianic Psalms. We'll talk more about the Messianic Psalms when we get to, to looking at, at uh, Jesus, uh, seeing Jesus in the Psalms. Then there are nine acrostic Psalms, all right? Nine acrostic Psalms. Now, we talked sometime, a few weeks ago about Psalm 119 and how it is a, it is a learning device that and you, you see that in your Bibles, by the way, we pointed out at the time, where, where each section of Psalm 119, the largest psalm in the collection of psalms, the largest chapter, uh, if you designate chapters, in the, in the Bible, that every section of it begins with a corresponding Hebrew letter of the alphabet. So Aleph, the Hebrew equivalent of our A, is, takes in the first section in every word. If we could read Hebrew, if we could look up there and see it, and we had to read it right to left, because that's how it's written, then the first letter of every line in that first section of Psalm 119 would be the Hebrew letter. It would start with the Hebrew letter Aleph. Every word would start with that. If you drop down to section number two, reading right to left, it'd be Beth. Uh, the, the sound of their letter would be equivalent to our letter B. When you get to the third one, uh, they depart from, or we depart from them. Uh, we would have C next in our alphabet, but their next letter is Gimel. Aleph, Beth, Gimel. And then, then Daleth, we're back to the D sound in the fourth letter. And every letter, remember now, every letter, first letter of every line in that section starts with the same uh, letter of the alphabet. There's nine of those, though, in the Psalms. Psalm 9, uh, Psalm 10, Psalm 25, Psalm 34, Psalm 37, Psalm 111, 112, 119, of course, and then 145. So that's, uh, when you take those psalms in, in those categories, that's one way to look at them. But, but someone else has done something, and I found this very fascinating when I was studying this. Look at 1 Chronicles 16.4. 1 Chronicles 16.4. Now we've gone through all of these summaries uh, previously here. In 1 Chronicles 16, verse 4, it's telling us about them bringing the ark, setting it inside the tent that David had pitched for it. Uh, verse 2, David had finished offering burnt offerings, peace offerings. He blessed the people in the name of the Lord, distributed to all Israel, both men and women, to each a loaf of bread, a portion of meat, cake of raisins. Then he, that is David, appointed some of the Levites as ministers before the ark of the Lord to do what? Now notice this, to invoke, to thank, and to praise the Lord, the God of Israel. Uh, Asaph was the chief, second to him was Zechariah, uh, Jael, and so on and so forth. And someone has seen this as a way to, to uh, unpack the Psalms, to take these three ideas, to invoke, to thank, to praise the God of Israel. So it would lead us to three different types of psalms. Lament, thanksgiving, and praise psalms. And people who've, who've looked at this as an indicator of how we ought to, to uh, break off the psalms into categories, 
than have done this further. And this is what I want to show you. I want to show you these, these uh, I think, 11. Uh, there's 10 of these that fall in this category, and then there's an 11 one we'll talk about in a minute. So you have, first of all, the individual lament psalms. Uh, these are directly addressed to God. They petition him to rescue and defend an individual. And you, you will recognize they have these elements in them. There's an introduction. They usually have a cry to God on the basis of something. Then there's the lament. Then there's a confession of trust in God. Uh, then the petition. And then a declaration or a vow of praise. And I want us to just, I uh, want you to look at one that's very prominent to you. Look at Psalm uh, 22. Psalm 22 is also one of the Messianic Psalms uh, because it's clearly the words of Jesus. Look at, look at Psalm 22. To the choir master, according to the, to the doe of the dawn, it's a Psalm of David. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Now we read that and we recognize that that's exactly what Jesus said on the cross centuries later. The words from this psalm anticipate the sorrow and sufferings of Jesus. Oh God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. And so you, you see this movement here. Uh, I'm a worm and no man, verse 6. This is the lament. Uh, Verse, verse 9, yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust in my mother's womb. There's this, this language of, of, of confidence. He appeals to him uh, to deliver him in the, in the later verses there. And then uh, the declaration of, of an avowal of praise. Look at this. Uh, verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. This, these great declarations, commitment to God and, and to praise God for who he is. All the ends of the earth shall remember and, re and turn to the Lord. Verse uh, 29, all the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Uh, verse uh, 30, prosperity Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness. So you see this, this movement in this, what's called an individual lament. Well, the second, uh, one of these categories under these three is the communal lament. And these are fascinating. This, uh, Psalm 44 is like this, Psalm 60, Psalm 70, Psalm 79 and 80. This is the, the difference here. You have the same structure, but the difference is that it's the nation or it's a, it's a, it's a collection of people. Someone is making this prayer, this, this petition on behalf of the nation. It's not been unusual, by the way, I'll say parenthetically, in, in our nation's history, when we've gone through, in the past at least, when we've gone through hard times, difficult times, that our leaders were prompted to draw from we'd call these communal lament songs. And when the nation had drifted away and it was clear that we were under the judgment of God and this, this cry on the behalf of our, our leaders unto God for the nation, you find these, these psalms in play at that time. Then, so you move from the lament to the thanksgiving. There are individual thanksgiving psalms. Again, the, the, uh, the, the psalmist publicly acknowledges God's activity uh, on his behalf or for him. Uh, they, they thank God for something he has already done or express confidence in what he will yet do. And a, and a praise, or I mean, a thanksgiving psalm on an individual has, this, has the proclamation of praise to God, a summary statement, a report of deliverance, a renewed vow of praise. Of course, you would anticipate that after the individual thanksgiving, there would be communal thanksgiving. And I want to look at uh, one of these. These acknowledgments made by the nation rather than individual. Look at Psalm 124 with me real quickly. Psalm 124. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let Israel now say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, when people rose up against us, then they would have swallowed us up alive when their anger was kindled against us. Then the flood would have swept us away. The torrent would have gone over us. Then over us would have gone the raging waters. Blessed be the Lord, 
who has not given us as prey to their teeth. We have escaped like a bird from the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we have escaped. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Here's this, this communal thanksgiving, thanksgiving to God on behalf of the people. And then you have uh, the next designation of is general praise psalms. Um, they are built around the word praise. I read you one of them in Psalm 150 is, is one of these. Uh, they're, they're more general than the, the Thanksgiving psalm is more about uh, something God has done. Uh, praise psalms tend to be more about who he is, his, his attributes. Certainly his, his, his activities are included, but his attributes are on display here. And the, and the word uh, hallelujah, which we heard, uh, praise the Lord, hallelujah, is prominent uh, in these psalms. Beyond the general praise psalms, though, there's this descriptive praise psalms. These, these more, are more focused, praising him for his attributes. Uh, psalm 33 is one of these. Uh, psalm 36, 105. Now, let's pick up one of these. Look, at, look with me at Psalm 147, one of, the, one of these last five, which sort of uh, become typical, reflecting upon the whole, the whole book of Psalms. Psalm 146, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. I will praise the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praises to my God while I have my being. Put not your trust in princes, in a son of man, in whom there is no salvation. When his breath departs, he returns to the earth. On that very day, his plans perish. Blessed is he whose help is in the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, who keeps faith forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free, and so on and on. And then it closes, the Lord will reign forever. You, O God, O Zion, to all, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. So there's this, this more of a descriptive praise. Then you have what's called the enthronement psalms. The enthronement psalms uh, extol and acknowledge the sovereign rule of God. And some anticipate that rule being taken up by Messiah. I want you to just, let's, uh, let's, let's look, uh, at, look over at Psalm 96. Because in at Psalm 96, you've got a cluster of these. 96, 97, 98, and 99. Psalm 96, O oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name. Tell of his salvation from day to day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. And so he, this goes on, and drop down to verse uh, nine. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say to the nations, the Lord reigns. Yes, the world is established. It shall never be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens be glad and let the earth rejoice. Let the sea roar in all that is in it. So you hear this, these great acknowledgments of God's ruling and reigning and sovereign. Look at, look at Psalm 97. The Lord reigns. Let the earth rejoice. Let the many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Righteousness and justice are the foundations of his throne. Fire goes before him and burns up his adversaries all around. His, his lightnings light up the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all. So you get this, this is a this powerful language of the enthronement psalms. Then there's the, there's the pilgrimage psalms. And I mentioned the, these songs of ascent that they would sing when they were on pilgrimage to go back to Jerusalem for, for Yom Kippur, uh, the Day of Atonement, the whole Passover festival and celebration. They did this also at Pentecost and at the Feast of Tabernacles. Then the, the ninth category is called the Royal Psalms. Uh, again, we have this picture of the reign of God. Look at, uh, just when we, look at Psalm 110 since we're close to that one. Psalm 110. And this is in, of course, book five. By the way, let me ask you, I didn't ask you a while ago, but to, how many of you in your Bibles have these, have these books designated? Book one, book two, you, you see that there? Okay. 
Okay, this is Psalm 110. is the Psalm of David. The Lord says to my Lord, Jesus cited this, by the way, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power. The uh, King James says your people will be made willing in the day of your power. They will, they will gladly be identified as your people when you come with your power upon them. Uh, the Lord has sworn, verse 4, and will not change his mind. You're a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By the way, when you see that, you know when you get over in the New Testament, that's a messianic psalm. It's an anticipation of this one who would be king, a king like Melchizedek, uh, with no beginning and no ending. Uh, the king uh, of uh, Mel Melchizedek, Zedek, remember, means king of righteousness. He rules over Salem. He rules over peace. Anyway, so you see this, uh, these royal psalms. Then there's what's called the wisdom and didactic psalms. I just want to take you to one. We won't try to read through it. It's Psalm 119, but I want you to see uh, this. We're going to be looking in the next couple of weeks at Proverbs, book of Proverbs, which is about wisdom. Well, in Psalm 119, here's, the, uh, here's this, this memorizing device where every section begins with a corresponding a uh, consecutive letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Does that remind you of anything? When you, if you're familiar with the book of Psalms, when you read that, what are you, what are you drawn back to? Psalm 1, right? Bless the man who, who doesn't uh, walk with the ungodly, doesn't, uh, doesn't stand, doesn't sit around those who are not uh, for God. His delight is in the law of the Lord, Psalm 1 says. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You've commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. By the way, I told you this when we looked at this in a different context a few weeks ago, but Psalm 119 exhausts the Hebrew vocabulary for different words to describe the law or commandments of God. Just pick up this real quickly. They walk in the law of the Lord, keep his testimonies. Uh, they walk in his ways. You've commanded your precepts, be kept diligently. Uh, your statutes, verse five, my eyes fixed on your commandments. And this, the whole, uh, the righteous rules is verse seven. And all the way through Psalm 119, you have all these different words used to describe the commandments of God. And it becomes for us a very evangelical psalm. By the way, when you read through it, you realize, though it was written uh, a long time ago, it speaks to us today. It challenges believers today to love God and keep his commandments, as, as the New Testament says, is the end of all things. So you have these wisdom and didactic psalms. Psalm 1, by the way, is also one of these. Then the, this, those are the 10. Those are the 10 that, that go into that category of, of invoke, and thank and praise. Then there's this 11th category. It's the imprecatory psalms. Are you familiar with that, with that word imprecatory? The imprecatory psalms pose problems for some people. These are the psalms, the word imprecatory means to call down a curse. They invoke divine judgment on one's enemies. And although some of them seem unreasonably harsh, you need to keep some things in mind. I want to, I want to remind you of some things, and then we're going to look at a couple of them uh, to wrap up this, this portion of our study of Psalms tonight. Listen to this. First of all, they call for divine justice rather than human vengeance. These imprecatory Psalms ask God to act. Remember in the New Testament, Hebrews, do not take vengeance, leave room for God. For vengeance is mine, says the Lord, I will repay. The imprecatory Psalms recognize that. You don't, you don't read in this, Lord, uh, bless me while I, while I crush my enemies. No, Lord, you avenge me on my enemies. So they call for divine justice rather than human vengeance. Secondly, they ask God to punish the wicked and thus vindicate his righteousness. Uh, it's, not, it's not just that they want God to vindicate them. They ask God for, to punish the wicked and thus vindicate 
his righteousness. Uh, you look around you today and you see how God is mocked left and right. I, mean, I just, about the time that I think, well, I, I think I've read the most ridiculous thing I could ever read. Something else comes up in view in the news. We have that, do you have that sense sometime of the psalmist, how long, O oh Lord? How long will you let the nation go the way it's going? How long will you let them uh, mock your character? A mainline denomination fairly recently had their general assembly. It would be the same as our Southern Baptist Convention, annual convention. And in their general assembly, uh, they had a, an imam a Muslim imam lead in prayer and then sort of teach upon his prayer to them. And they regaled in this and wanted to be seen as inclusive as he prayed to Allah the Beneficent. Uh, he taught after he prayed that we need to put an end to, to religious bigotry. He then identified and, and thanked Allah for the prophets and named Jesus among the prophets. And this happened in what would be called a mainline Protestant Christian denomination. The name of God mocked, uh, even by those who purport to be his friends. And so these, these imprecatory psalms ask God, move God, rise. Affect judgment on the wicked. Vindicate your righteousness. They also condemn sin. And one writer I was reading made this observation. I think it's important. We hear a lot today about, well, God... God hates the sin and loves the sinner. In the Hebrew mindset, there was not this distinction between a sinner and his sin. In fact, it's important to understand, and Psalm 711 says this, that God draws his bow daily against the wicked to let his bow of wrath fly, the arrow of his wrath fly. Sin is not an abstract concept. Sin cannot happen in the woods if nobody hears it. Sin only has meaning as, it's, as it is attached to human personality and action. This is what David is getting at, by the way, in Psalm 51, one of the penitential Psalms, where he cries out, have mercy on me, and he confesses his sin. He says, for in sin, did my mother conceive me? Now, I've taught you this before. He was not talking about the circumstances surrounding the conduct of his mother as far as how he, how he came to be conceived. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about that when he was conceived at conception with all of his chromosomes intact, that he was a sinner because he had personality. He's a human being at conception. And so the Hebrews didn't recognize this distinction. And so they condemn sin as it occurs in sinful people and want God to vindicate his holiness, his justice. And then finally, the imprecatory Psalms. Remember that Jesus called down a curse on several cities and told his disciples to curse cities that do not receive the gospel. Remember? The curse of Jesus. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. If the things that have been done in Tyre and Sidon had been done in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Will you rise up? Pretty much I tell you no. You go down to the depths. Jesus invoked this kind of imprecatory language upon cities who had, who had seen his mighty works and rejected them. So now, with that little bit of a background, let's look for a few minutes at, the, at some imprecatory psalms. Let's go back to Psalm 7. We're told that Psalm 7 is a shigeoth of David. She sang to the Lord concerning the words of Cush, a Benjamite, who was, uh, who was cursing, who had it in for David. O Lord, my God, if you, in you do I take refuge. Save me from all my pursuers and deliver me, lest like a lion they tear my soul apart. Look at verse 6. Arise, O Lord, 
in your anger. Lift yourself up against the fury of my enemies. Awake for me. You have appointed judgment. Let the assembly of the peoples be gathered about you. Over it, return on high. Verse 9. Oh, let the evil of the wicked come to an end. And may you establish the righteous. You who test the minds and hearts, O righteous. My shield is with God. Look at verse 12. If a man does not repent, God will wet, W-H-E-T, will, will put the wet stone and sharpen his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. He has placed, has prepared for him his deadly weapons, making his arrows fiery shafts. Behold, the wicked man conceives evil and is pregnant with mischief and gives birth to lies. He makes a pit digging it out. He falls into the hole that he has made. His mischief returns upon his own head, his own skull, and on his own skull his violence descends. He's describing the activity of God there. He's called upon God to take vengeance, to act on his behalf against the, his pursuers, the, those enemies who pursue him. But it's pow the powerful uh, warlike vengeance language here. Verse 11, God is a righteous judge and God, a God who feels indignation every day. Verse 12, if a man does not repent, God will wet his sword. He has bent and readied his bow. So this, this picture the psalmist gives us, David gives us here, that God is ready to act. It's this kind of language, by the way, just let me, let me tell you, if you're, if you're familiar with Jonathan Edwards' sermon, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. If you haven't read that in a while, you need to go back and read that. Edwards says that uh, his text is that his, his foot will slip in due time, that, it, that, that the wicked are living on a, on a slippery foundation. And Edwards goes into this graphic description that you, you are like a spider dangling by a thin web, and God holds you over the flames of hell. And it's only his good pleasure that keeps you out of hell this moment. He gives the description of walking across fire on a, on a, a thatched floor. But it's only a matter of time before the flames grab, grab hold of the flooring, consume it, and you fall into the flames. This language is not always easy for us to embrace. Pe people use this kind of language, in fact. Try to use it against us at the idea that God is loving. How can God be loving and, and these, uh, these kind of words be used of God? In fact, I heard a man say, I, I could call his name. I actually uh, had engaged him at one point when I was at Southwestern Seminary, and he, he taught a seminar uh, that I was required to part of my, as a part of my doctoral studies, I was required to go to this seminar put on. Uh, and he was talking, he said, I have, I have real doubt. He's talking about the authority of scripture. He says, I have real doubt that God ever told anybody as he, as he caricatured it to bash in the heads of babies. As he kept on going and I was listening and taking notes, he said, in fact, I want to tell you this. This is a quote now. It's burned into my conscience as long as I have a memory. I want to tell you this. The God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament are not the same people. And that's the word he used, are not the same people. And then he went on to attribute what he calls scrabble flaws to Old Testament passages which seem to speak in this imprecatory way about God taking vengeance on his enemies. So I went up to him after the meeting. And I said, how do you know what you know? What is your authority for asserting that the God who reveals himself in the Old Testament is not the same God who reveals himself in the New Testament? Well, he was at a seminar where, 
where the whole time he was talking, there were people, there were professors and other people much smarter than me in the room, and he was sort of playing. He really thought he was just playing to the crowd because they were really taking it in. He didn't realize he had a, because he, he looked at me and he said, oh, you're one of those. And I said, you mean I'm one of those people who believes the Bible, every word of it, cover to cover? He said, no, you're one of those wooden-headed fundamentalists who don't think for themselves. And I said, well, I, there's some things you don't need to think about. You don't need to think about and question the revelation of the Old Testament when Jesus and the writers of the New Testament approve of what the Old Testament has to say. Well, we, obviously we were at an impasse. And he finally looked at me and he said, because remember I was about, oh goodness, I was 20 in my late 20s at the time maybe. He said, if you represent the future of the Southern Baptist Convention, it makes me very afraid. And I said, well, I don't know if I represent the future of the SBC, and I'm not sure that the SBC wants me representing its future. But I can tell you this, your position on Scripture should make you very afraid. We talked this morning, folks, about the sufficiency of Scripture. These Psalms, we don't need to run from them, we don't need to be ashamed of them. What we need to do is embrace them and say, you know, our God is a sovereign God. And He does. He has, He will, and He does take vengeance on people, on societies, on nations. History is a record of people and movements who have been placed on the ash heap by God because they thought themselves smarter than Him, bigger than Him, wiser than Him. What are we to take from this as we close tonight and, and, and next week dive into the looking at, at Jesus Christ in the Psalms? Well, I want you to take this from the imprecatory Psalms. And this is how Paul couched it. If this God is for us, who can be against us? What is the most amazing manifestation of God's holy vengeance and justice ever manifested in the history of the world? It wasn't the slaughter of the Amalekites, every man, woman, and child. It wasn't the drowning of the human population except for eight people. It was the putting to death on the cross, his darling son. It is the inescapable, infallible message about how God views sin. And it should remind us that if we are following Jesus Christ, this God is for us. And it may seem in our day and time that the wicked uh, are getting the upper hand, that the wicked seem to be having their way, uh, but it will not always be that way. If that's the way it really is, it will not always be that way. We have a God who will vindicate his holy name. He will vindicate uh, the questions about his justice, about his, the appearance of his tarrying, as Peter's handling in, in, in Peter when he answers the question, where is this promise coming? He will vindicate his people who follow him through thick and thin. He has a special place. Revelation tells us there's a special place for the martyrs, they are under, they live under the throne of God. God will vindicate. That's why we don't need to take vengeance. We need to leave room for God. Vengeance is His. He will repay. And the imprecatory Psalms are evidence. I want to be careful here that there are times, and let's be sure that we're not doing this out of, out of anger that's unrighteous, but there are times when the people of God need to say, God, arise. Bear the arm of your power. Silence. Silence. This noise that casts aspersion on you and your word and your way of salvation. Silence this movement that is sweeping the globe 
that places your son, denigrates him as one prophet among many, denies the crucifixion, denies the resurrection. Lord, rise. We pray almost every Wednesday night when we're going through the countries we're praying for the persecuted. Lord, hasten the day when you bring Islam down into the dust. Ideally, by the salvation of multitudes of Muslims. But Lord, vindicate your name. Glorify yourself. And take vengeance upon those who've set themselves up as your enemies. There's a place to pray that. And we learn that in the Psalms and we see Jesus applying it in the New Testament. We're going to stop there. Any questions or comments?